This is Stephen. So, hello, back again. My name is Martin Tramer. I'm from Geneva, Switzerland. I have the great pleasure to moderate this second morning session. We have four talks. The rules are the same. 10 minutes presentation, 10 minutes discussion. And you have seen that in the end, we have actually a 10 minutes slot. So if somebody is too late, it is not a problem but please if you have questions don't give a talk just give a short question um, we will talk about bias in reporting and publication of research and the first talk will be given by Gil and Adam augmenta augmenting systematic reviews with information from clinicaltrials.gov to increase transparency and reduce bias Hi, let me bend this down a little more. My name is Galen Adam and I'm here representing four teams of researchers across multiple institutions who have undertaken a series of projects looking at the impact that searching clinicaltrials.gov had on a series of ongoing systematic reviews. Before I get started, a bit of background. This research was commissioned by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, a small agency within Health and Human Services in the United States. Its mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer and more accessible, equitable, and affordable, and to work with HHS and other partners to make sure that the evidence is understood and used. EPCs, or evidence-based practice centers, are comprised of research scientists and physicians who conduct systematic reviews which provide independent and unbiased synthesis of research. Many derivative products come from EPC reviews, including clinical practice guidelines and policy guidance. In this project, we ask the question, does information from clinicaltrials.gov impact the conclusions of a systematic review? What additional resources are needed to incorporate that information? What patterns did we see in terms of potential biases and transparency? And when is it worthwhile to do these searches? Some terminology before we get started. In this presentation, a study is the actual research conducted. A record is the clinicaltrials.gov report of a study and a publication is the journal article report of a study. For this project, we looked at five systematic reviews. All were ongoing projects so that we could measure prospectively the resource use and payoff of clinicaltrials.gov searches in real time. They were intentionally based in difficult, different, not difficult, different clinical areas and populations with diseases that range from reproductive and physical health to mental health. They span different types of interventions, including drugs, alternative medicines, behavioral interventions, devices, surgeries, supplements, complex interventions, and so on. Though the methods varied somewhat across the four EPCs, in general, they included the following a search of clinicaltrials.gov to the last date of the original review search, screening the records using the original review's eligibility criteria, extracting information from the records, and assessing risk of bias and applicability. Finally, we looked at the impact on conclusions and strength of evidence in the report. Some specific variations that are worth mentioning. Two projects also searched WHO's ICTRP one project reached out to study authors by phone and email, and four projects plan to incorporate new results in meta-analyses. 
In assessing the impact on the systematic review of the records found, we looked at three specific things. First, studies that had both a record and a publication. For these studies, we compared the record to the publication in terms of design details, population description, sample size, details about the interventions, outcomes, and results if they were given. The second area was studies that had a record in clinicaltrials.gov, but with no publication. For these studies, we documented the study status, whether they were completed, discontinued, or ongoing, and relevant dates. We also incorporated the results of these studies into the systematic review if they were applicable and usable. Finally, we looked at studies with a publication, but no record. For these, we looked for the reasons why they were not included in the registry. This involves some hypothesizing. So, here's what we found. In general, a large number of published studies are not registered in clinicaltrials.gov, between 43 and 86 percent, in part because many are old and predate clinicaltrials.gov, but also because users may not find clinicaltrials.gov relevant. In addition, between 10 and 30 percent of the records did not have an associated publication. However, it is worth noting that these numbers may not be totally accurate because we found that it was difficult to match records to publications. Between PubMed and clinic, oh, I'm sorry, especially where trials were not correctly indexed to crosswalks between PubMed and clinicaltrials.gov. In fact, one group attempted to automate this matching process to streamline finding relevant records, but when it were unable to do so, in part because of lack of consistent indexing. For the studies that had both a record and a publication, we found relatively good agreement between the record and the publication, especially when it came to design elements and intervention descriptions. We did find some discrepancies in lists of outcomes as they were either specified in the record or reported in the, report, in the publication. For example, in the Omega-3 project, we found that of all the results, 71, a majority, were reported in both clinicaltrials.gov and the publications. Two, both clinical outcomes, were reported only in clinical trials records, and 25 appeared for the first time in publications. These were primarily intermediate outcomes, lipids and blood pressure, though in three papers they were clinical outcomes, including non-fatal stroke, myocardial infarction, and revascularization. That said, we found that the Newly reported results followed the same patterns in terms of direction and statistical significance as those that matched. It is worth noting that there are many reasons for these types of discrepancies, one being outcome reporting bias. In addition, it is also worth noting that many records were not prospectively registered. They were created after the study had begun and it sometimes after it had finished. This may have led to underestimation of the actual discrepancies between pre-specified and reported outcomes. The group at RTI reached out to 15 authors to ask them why they had or had not registered their studies. The report looked at mental health in children and adolescents, which entail by nature complex and system level interventions. Ten authors replied, of whom four had registered their studies. Of these four, three noted no barriers to registering. One noted a mismatch between the nature of the study and the purpose of clinicaltrials.gov, and three questioned the utility of registering this sort of study in clinicaltrials.gov. Next, we looked at studies that had a record but could not be matched to a publication. The figure on this slide is from the Omega-3 project. The red studies have both a record and a publication in the report. The black studies have a record but no matching publication. Each line is a single study with a dot for its start date and another for its end date. As you can see, the studies included in the report are older than those not included in the report. And in fact, many of those not included in the report were still ongoing at the date of the search, indicated by the solid blue line. However, 
Johns Hopkins, in their report on diabetic peripheral neuropathy, DPN in this table, found in seven of the 23 studies with records only, the record had results, suggesting either completion of the study or reporting of interim results. And in fact, 13 of the 23 records were more than three years old. An arbitrary cutoff we suggested would indicate results should have been published. They found that for almost all interventions, the new results had no or minimal impact on the findings of the report. But for one outcome, they were able to do an updated meta-analysis. The figure in the slide shows the standardized mean difference in pain scores comparing pregabalin with pl placebo, stratified by the studies found in the published literature for the versus those found only in records. The clinicaltrials.gov records report a less dramatic effect. But the direction is the same. This figure also seems to show more of a temporal pattern rather than one that would necessarily suggest publication bias. This could be a result of time lag bias or just that early studies are usually done in the populations most likely to benefit from the intervention. Finally, we looked at studies that had a publication but no registry record. Many of these studies were older, were not randomized controlled trials, or were not conducted in the United States. For example, in the tympanostomy tubes project, 172 studies, 54 of which were randomized controlled trials, were not found in the registry search. Looking at the randomized controlled trials, 22 were older than clinicaltrials.gov's inception date of 2000, and another 13 were not con included, conducted in the United States. So what does this all mean? What is the value of including registry searches in rigorous systematic review projects. For one thing, you may identify studies not included in the review. For example, we found many records in clinicaltrials.gov that did not have results or publications, and about 30% of these studies were completed more than three years ago. Because of the lack of results, we could not determine whether these studies would have impacted the conclusions of our reports. Another value comes in the ability to compare prospective records with publications to see what the discrepancies between the report and the record are, and whether those are indicative of any sort of bias. But as we found, those differences can be difficult to interpret, in part because of the limited information given in clinicaltrials.gov and the fact that so many studies are retrospectively registered. Finally, registries can be a good source of information on ongoing research and may be used to help define future research needs. However, these benefits come at a cost in terms of staff time to do the work of manually screening and matching records. Better indexing in the major databases, such as Medline, might improve this and even allow for automation. How can journal editors help? Journals might enforce the requirement to list studies in clinicaltrials.gov, ideally prospectively. They might also help by creating a format which requires that the registration number go in a certain consistent place in each article to streamline indexing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Can you hear me? You searched only in one clinical trial registry. What do we know about non-US studies, for instance, that are registered in other registries? Well, two of our projects, the uh, Omega-3 project and the tympanostomy tubes projects, also did a full search in the ICTRP's, or the WHO's ICTRP registry, which is the International Trials Registry. Um, what we found was that those records, by and large, did not include results. Um, but the other thing we found was, like searching something like Embase in the addition to Medline, sometimes we found clinicaltrials.gov records that we had missed in our clinicaltrials.gov search. Um, that registry definitely needs much, much better indexing to make, make it more usable, and they need to move towards including results in their records. But should we actually encourage authors 
from non-English speaking countries, for instance, and I'm representing a journal where two thirds of all submissions are coming from non-English speaking countries, should we encourage them to register their, their study protocols in, in really in, in one of these big international or US databases or shall they register in their national databases? China or India or whatever. Well, from my perspective, I think so long as it's consistently indexed and we can access those records, um, it doesn't really matter. Um, Should it be in English? It's, is the publication in English? If the publication is in English, maybe they should be in English. Uh, Mark, Mark Helfand, Portland, Oregon. Do I need to turn it on? We hear you. Oh, good. Okay. Well, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, my question is about the measures that you used, particularly the one where you had a slide of a meta-analysis result and says, oh, here's what this would have added. My, my, uh, let me give you, my concern is that that may be a pretty limited way of looking at the impact of clinicaltrials.gov results. And most of this is about the registry, what studies exist, what did they measure, how many outcomes, and so on. But this is more about those that had results in clinicaltrials.gov. And other people would come from this, come from the exact opposite or very opposite direction. They'd say, well, what outcomes are reported in clinicaltrials.gov and are they in the journal publication or are they reported differently? You talked about discrepancies and you talked about adding to a meta-analysis. So let me just ask this. Uh, this. There's a, a drug that's now out uh, for a couple years now that's used for a relatively rare cancer. Um, the journal article, which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, um, along with voluminous supplements and the protocol and everything, uh, didn't actually mention the quality of life results. In order to find them, you know, the only place you could find the quality of life results was in clinicaltrials.gov. There, therefore, there, went to, there wasn't any pooling or any meta-analysis of that outcome in a systematic review. And um, uh, the impact would be, gee, if you're looking at this, you should know that the quality of life impact was practically none. You wouldn't know it from the journal article, and of course you can't tell it from protocols or from registry entries. How would an impact like that show up in your, in, in your study? Could a systematic review that hadn't planned to do a meta-analysis of quality of life in the first place be changed by saying, you know what, we found out that they had no impact on quality of life. Or did you only look at impacts on, you know, meta-analyses? No, that's an excellent point, and that's where being limited to a 10-minute talk makes things a little tough. Um, we, that is, in fact, that quality of life, um, new results reported in clinicaltrials.gov records are a, a real source of information for systematic reviews. In several of the systematic reviews we've done subsequently, we found data in clinicaltrials.gov records, particularly actually as it pertains to adverse events, which clinicaltrials.gov is very strict about how they're reported, much, much more strict and much more complete than the journal articles tend to be. Um, so that's an excellent point. If you can find new information and new results in clinicaltrials.gov, that will, of course, have, have an impact on the resulting systematic review. Please. Hi, Christine Rasmussen from the Nordic Cochrane Center. Thank you for an interesting uh, talk. I was wondering, in your last sort of uh, comments, you were mentioning that editors uh, could help with this, and I was wondering whether you think the responsible people should be the funders of the study, or the investigators, or authors, in terms of registering um, a trial, or even trials that have been conducted already, could you say, well, editors could say, we will only allow to publish your study if you also register previous studies that we know you've conducted. Would that be an option? 
I think that would be fantastic. I mean, as a systematic reviewer, the more information there is, the happier we are. Um, I think that we do a lot of sort of, not really denigrating or criminalizing, but putting a lot of this stuff on the researchers and saying, you know, you're creating biased studies, you're not registering things prospectively, you're doing selective outcome reporting bias, and I think that, you know, we need to, to you know, and maybe the, I'm being naive, but we need to go on the assumption that they are scientists and they're trying to do good things. So if we can give them a format and say, this needs to be registered, it needs to be registered prospectively. Funders are much more involved in saying that you have to register your trial if you're going to buy a certain point, if you're going to, you know, get our money. Um, so I think that that's really important. I think that to the extent that we can make this stuff easy um, for them, as in saying, here's a box, put your clinicaltrials.gov or any other registration number in this box, um, you know, that, that will allow crosswalks, it'll allow identifying these things better, it will reduce staff time for systematic reviewers who are trying to match these records. I hope that answers the question. Okay, any last question? Nothing? Yeah, just very quickly, 30 seconds. Um, so I noticed that on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, I did a search about 60% of clinical uh, results were not provided with statistical analysis. So they're just raw results. So um, what do you think about uh, the utility of clinicaltrials.gov for a average patient or clinicians who may not have had statistical training. Um, so even if the results are shared uh, and the systematic reviewer can use them probably, um, but they're not interpretable for people without training. Um, so what do you think? Is it, is it important and should we add? I um, think that that's a, another very good point. Um, I unfortunately can't get in the heads of, of people who are designing clinicaltrials.gov, but I think that it's got to be a real challenge to be trying to create one database for all of us, um, patients, clinicians, systematic reviewers, researchers. Um, and I think that, you know, one thing we found was that sometimes the results were only given after some sort of statistical analysis and we couldn't go back to the raw data and therefore, we couldn't incorporate them in our meta-analyses because we couldn't get to the metric we needed. Um, so I think that what is reported in clinicaltrials.gov, um, you know, it needs to, you know, we want the raw numbers and we need to know uh, what the analyzed results are, what they mean, and what they were uh, corrected for in a perfect world. Thank okay, you thank you very much. The second presentation will be done by Stephen Woloshin, bias associated with publication <coughs> of interim results of randomized trials. Please, Stephen. Great, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start with disclosures. Our co-authors have no disclosures, but Lisa and I have three. First, we're married to each other. Secondly, um, the peer review Congress is our favorite meeting. And third, we're both ex expert witnesses in testosterone litigation. Um, so publication of interim results can introduce uncertainty and inflate uh, treatment effects. Um, the results are, tend to be imprecise because there are a smaller number of events, um, and prior research has shown that interim results um, tend to overflate, over inflate um, treatment effects, which can be a problem because uh, results may change over, over time that could mislead uh, clinicians and providers and patients. Um, also, um, in, early, uh, sorry, um, interim results can also undermine the integrity of trials because 
It can interfere with recruitment. It could encourage unblinding, and it can um, encourage dropouts and crossovers. Um, so we got interested in this topic when a reporter approached us about a new, newly approved uh, drug for advanced breast cancer. Um, and it turned out that the trial, um, a phase three trial, was approved on the basis of interim results by the FDA. And the trial was also reported in a medical journal. And what it showed was that uh, the, in the interim progression-free survival was about four months uh, improvement with the drug. Overall survival results were presented as well, but they were deemed immature because there were few events. About a year later, the final progression-free survival results were reported, confirming the uh, interim report. And then in a separate publication, final overall survival results were reported, and here the conclusion was that the drug had no effect on survival. And looking at these three papers, we noticed something curious. What we noticed was that the interim results, so the ones associated with the most uncertainty, were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is, of course, one of the most you know, the highest impact factor journals uh, in the world. But the subsequent, the final um, publications, which um, FDA used to change the label, appeared in journals with much, much lower impact factors. And at no point did the New England Journal make mention of or link to um, any of the final results. And that is what motivated our study to describe publication of interim results from ongoing trials and compare the prominence and consistency with final publication. We searched um, PubMed um, 2006 to 2015 looking for randomized trials with the words interim, not mature or immature in the title or in the abstract. Um, we found 1,267 articles. We excluded completed pilot studies, protocols, cancer trials with final primary outcomes like progression-free survival, but an interim secondary outcome such as uh, overall survival. And that left us with 613 um, trials reporting interim results of ongoing trials. Of these, um, 442 were stopped early, either for benefit, harm, or futility and that left us a final pool of 171 articles which were ongoing trials reporting interim results for efficacy or safety. Um, the reason for the interim publication was stated in 40% of the, of the papers as being protocol specified analyses. But 50% of the time, the, uh, the, the, the paper didn't state a reason for the interim analysis anywhere. So there's no information why it was done. The remaining 10%, um, the authors gave a variety of reasons. For example, one author said that um, he, they were afraid of being scooped by rival investigators, and that's what prompted the publication. Another case, um, an investigator said it would be really helpful for an upcoming grant submission to have a publication done, and that was the reason for this interim publication. Um, these trials were pub published largely in oncology and surgery, and um, almost half were solely or partly industry funded. To find the final pub publications, we searched PubMed, clinicaltrials.gov, Web of Science using registry um, numbers if available, PubMed IDs, um, and we also searched names of the authors of interim publications as well. And if we were unable to find um, a final publication, we also tried to contact authors of the interim publication using their emails. We restricted our um, analysis to the 158 ongoing interim trials where there was sufficient time for a final publication, which we defined as at least one year past the registry defined completion date. We found 90 final publications corresponding to the um, interim publications. So um, just, over <laughs> just over half of the, um, of the interim publications had a final publication. Among these, 72 were, uh, were matched interim and final publications reporting the same primary outcome results. So did interim and final abstract conclusions change qualitatively? Um, what we found was that in 85% of the time, the, they didn't change. The qualitative conclusion was the same, but 15% of the time, they did. 8% became weaker. For example, the interim publication said the carpecitabine containing chemotherapy regimen reduced breast cancer recurrence compared with a control schedule of standard agents. But the final publication said the regimen did not improve recurrence-free survival. 
So in other words, the result flipped from helped to, to did not help. 7% of the time, the um, conclusions became stronger. For example, the interim report concluded that after four weeks, 5% lidocaine medicated plaster treatment was associated with similar levels of analgesia, but the final report concluded that 5% lidocaine medicated plaster showed better efficacy. So in this case, the, um, the result flipped from the drug not being not better to being better. We also found that interim and final publications had similar pro prominence. For example, um, about the same proportion appeared in high impact factor journals. We defined that as impact factor greater than or equal to 20. They were also equally likely to be in to the top five impact factor journals. Among the 19%, um, uh, this 19 percent, only one third also appeared in a, in a, in a top five journal in the, in the final form. We also looked at um, traditional and social media prominence using altimetric rating, and again, there was no difference between the, the interim and final publication. So let me talk about limitations. Um, we may have um, uh, underestimated interim publication prevalence because not all interim publications use the word interim in the title or the abstract. And we avoided very nonspecific terms like preliminary because we got way, way too many results. Um, in addition, um, we may have underestimated the final publication rate because we may have missed final publications in our searches. Um, and when we had, when no, when no final publications came up in our searches, I said we tried to contact authors, but only about half responded to our queries. In addition, trial registry tr completion dates may not be up to date, so it's possible that some trials that were not ripe for final publication, so less than one year from the trial um, completion date, um, may have gotten into the denominator, which would, um, uh, the result would be it would lower, it would underestimate the final uh, publication rate. We also may be understating the extent of interim to final changes because we only assessed primary outcomes, but secondary outcomes, for example, overall survival, may be the most clinically important outcomes of, of all. So in summary, many interim publications report analyses that are not pre-specified or lack a compelling justification. Frequent non-publication may cause bias since the treatment effects remain unknown. And interim and final publications have similar journal and media prominence, although the conclusions may change. So what can journals do? Well, one thing would be to limit publication of interim results from ongoing trials to those with a reasonable justification. So for example, um, requiring that they're pre-specified uh, in, the, in the protocol and that they have a reasonable number of outcomes so the results are s stable. The other thing would be to limit the publication to um, cases w least likely to cause bias. So for example, trials where recruitment is complete and there are no ongoing treatments. When journals do choose to publish interim results, they can, there's a few things they can do. One would be to highlight the interimness and the justification for the interim publication. And let me show you what I mean. We'll go back to, this is the study that inspired uh, th this project. Um, one thing that the journal could do in order to um, highlight the interimness of the, of the publication to readers would be to include it in the title. Right? This is a pre-planned interim analysis and they could easily put this in the title. Um, when a study is not a pre uh, when there is an unplanned interim analysis, it would be really refreshing to see titles like this. <laughs> the other thing that journals can do is to highlight to readers the existence or the, of the um, final results. So a lot of journals will have links to related articles. That's pretty routine nowadays. What we're thinking is that it would be great to also link to the final results. So the journals can do that in a bunch of ways. One would be to have their own summary of the final results, or they could link externally to the, uh, to the published trial, or they could link to um, re um, regulatory um, sites, if that's where the, the, the final results appear, or um, to, um, so, and so on. And the other thing they can do is if there are no um, final reports, they could say the final report, it, the final results have not been reported to make that cr cr crystal clear to readers. Thank you.
Questions, please. Do you think some authors are using this term interim or preliminary or whatever just to hide the fact that recruitment was very difficult, that the study did not really advance, and that just want to publish that stuff? <laughs> um, it's po it's po I mean, it's possible that, that just like the discussion before about some of the other terms, um, the, 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 the terms interim and uh, publication probably are, are not well, well defined. It may mean different things to different people. But in the end, I think if the, the journals are, you know, really take a stand that you've got to have a good reason for it and then are really clear so that readers um, understand the interim nature of the publication, I think that would help. Lisa? Thank you. You showed some great quotes from the conclusions. And I'm just wondering, did you look at the main changes in the results themselves? Was it just a narrowing of uncertainty or or what were the changes there? Yeah, that's a great question. So we focused on looking at the abstract re results, but that's a great idea. We ought to take a look for the when we do the final our final publication. <laughs> These are interim results. <laughs> Uh, Ivan Oransky from Retraction Watch. I'm very interesting, and I'm wondering, and I'm probably going to mangle the uh, the term here a little bit. But um, if you were to do a sort of intention, you know, intent to treat analysis, and figure that all of the studies that didn't, you could, where you couldn't find final, um, you know, publication, final result publication, had the quote unquote negative outcome, or or the sort of a different outcome, do you think this would look very different? I mean, I have my biases, of course, but what, what do you think that might look like? You, you mean, are, <clears throat> you, you're suggesting that maybe the unpublished were all negative trials? Well, I, I'm not saying that they necessarily were, but I'm, if you were to do an analysis as if that were your sort of, an intention to treat analysis, if that was you know, the case. Well, I don't know the answer, but I think that it would be really great to know. I mean, this is a real great source of bi bias, and um, so that's a great project. Thank you. <laughs> Fiona? Um, I think it builds slightly on that, Fiona Godley from the BMJ, just to, I think that's such a great um, sub, uh, data set you've got there, and uh, it may not be big enough to look at, but I wonder whether the, when, when things became weaker, if you do a subgroup analysis of that group, whether they were more likely to be published in less high profile journals. I mean, it's that, it, did you, you didn't present an analysis, it may be, maybe not enough data to do that, but. Right, we didn't, uh, there, uh, the, the number of trials is not that big, but, but I think we could do that. We could take a, a look at that, and that would be inter interesting to, to see. And Mark Helfand again. Mark Helfand again. Uh, Steve, very nice. Hey, can you, uh, I have a quibble with one of the conclusions, oh, but I can't remember it unless you go back to the conclusion slide. <laughs> so um, could you reel back a little bit? Yeah, I know it's going to be a oh, lot. Oh, it's the other way. Sorry. So yeah. the conclusion. Uh, yeah. Hold on. Um, yeah, it says frequent non-publication. Uh, the one before. Oops. The one before this. Before this. Yeah, I think. This yeah. way. Frequent non-publication may cause bias since final treatment effects remain unknown. Well, there. Just uh, since your study is an interim analysis, <laughs> when when a study is terminated early for benefit or harm. All right, uh, that means that usually means they're not going to recruit anybody else, but it may mean that, but they may be able to follow people up to a, longer to the intended amount of follow-up time. So if they terminated when everybody had, you know, an average of four months, but the protocol said 12, there's nothing stopping them from having a final treatment effect that's different. So I would, I would, uh, back to that sorry. slide. So yeah, just, doing so that. that it's not, yeah, sorry, but. Let me go back to that. Yeah, so frequent non-publication, yeah. What actually would be needed is to look at those that were terminated early for benefit and see from you know, clinical trials results or something whether in fact they had a follow-up analysis because they, they may have followed people longer. Yeah, that's it. I'll look at one again. I don't know who's doing that. But, um, that's a, a great point. Just to stress, we looked at, we didn't look at trials that were stopped early for benefit. We looked at on, trials that were ongoing um, but right. but your, your point is yeah, great, and some people have, I think I, we saw a, a, a couple of studies actually lo looking, looking at that, but I think that's really important. Yeah, just, again, it's off Sorry. the slide, but the point is that that conclusion or that summary point refers to the ones that you didn't look at, the ones that were um, 
you know, it, it, it includes those that were uh, stopped for benefit, so that's why I brought it up. Okay, yep. thank you. Quibble Please. accepted. Please. Uh, Hal Sox from Bacori. Um, Steve, I'm wondering whether the biology of the disease that's being treated may be a confounder and that some diseases by their nature just end up with bad results like advanced breast cancer where others you wouldn't necessarily see the biology driving control and intervention together. Well, that's certainly true, but um, it would, you know, th th there's no reason to not to be clear about what it is an interim publication, what's a final publication, um, and letting people, you know, highlighting that to people so they're looking for it, and being aware of the fact that the things do change, and while the biology may confound the, you know, what happens in, in the end, um, it's still a matter of transparently reporting what evidence you've gathered and then presenting in a way that it's clear to readers. Thank you. Steve? Uh, hi, whoa, sorry. Uh, Steve Goodman from Stanford Metrics. Um, so th this is a really interesting study. Uh, in terms of irony, the, the, uh, on the issue of stop trials, not the ones that continued, there, there actually was a, a publication a number of years ago that purported to show that they had a huge bias. Uh, a number of people, including myself, pointed out that that, and that was published in one of the top trial five journals, that that had a methodologic error. Uh, and then the authors, about five or six years later, ultimately conceded that that was an error and, and sort of modified their interpretation. The first paper had about 500 citations. The subsequent paper had maybe 12. So uh, that's an irony on top of an irony that showed that interim results had a benefit and that interim report was not right and, and, and referenced too much. But my question is, um, this, w wasn't this in a sense a selected sample of trials that continued because people weren't sure enough about the results so that they didn't stop them early? So trials that are stopped early for benefit and reported at that point. They're usually reported and that's the last report because they're pretty sure that this is the truth. Um, you know, either because they use stopping rules or a variety of other reasons. So if they continue, that's exactly the situation in which people think that, that, um, that the, the, the book is not closed. And I was very interested to see that 85% of them in fact didn't change and and the remaining 50% split 50-50 going both directions, which vindicated that judgment. They, they're pretty sure it was worth reporting, but they kept going and it, you know, sort of was the flip of a coin where it went. Um, is, is that a right interpretation? And, and doesn't this, in a sense, vindicate their judgment, even though I'm very delighted to hear that the final report was sort of cited as, you know, just as prominent as the early one? Vindic I'm sorry, vindicate which judgment? The judgment that, that they really weren't sure enough about mm. what was going on and the trial merited continuing. Right, I mean, I think I may be giving a little too much credit because someone, a lot of times we'd have no idea why they were continuing. And the few times when I, I gave some examples of crazy reasons, but, um, but you're probably right. And, um, but, but that's why we have final, that's why we have final results. Um, so it's good that the trials would keep keep going. I mean, interim publication is some, sometimes appropriate. Final publication is really cru crucial. Yeah. No, I wasn't taking issue with the, the results. I was just wondering about the selection process. But um, anyway, it was a very, very nice piece. Yeah, and we, uh, your, we enjoyed your paper about stop, stopping for nothing. That was... Uh, yeah, that was it. That was great, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So we changed the topic, we talk about spin, and we heard a definition this morning earlier, bias presentation on interpretation to make results look more favorable. The first presentation will be given by Mona Gannat from Amsterdam. Identification and classification of spin in clinical studies evaluating biomarkers in ovarian cancer.
Where's the text? We don't have a text on the screen. Can the technicians help, please? Otherwise, we have slides without text. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation um, to present. I'm very honored to be here among such presenters this morning. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, contribution of my co-authors, Maria Olsen, Isabel Butron, and Patrick Basu to the project, and the European Commission for funding the project. I'm gonna tell you about uh, the project Identification and Classification of SPIN in Clinical Studies, Evaluating Biomarkers in Ovarian Cancer. So we heard earlier a definition of SPIN, um, and uh, this may be redundant, but SPIN is a form of misrepresentation of studying findings. It's defined as a way of reporting that is conscious, but very often unconscious, that makes the study findings appear more favorable than the results justify. So the term SPIN was first used in the medical literature in the BMJ in 1995 by Richard Horton about the rhetoric of research. He looked deeply in the discussion section of an article and the specific strategy to spin the study results. This is one of the first studies to systematically ev evaluate the prevalence of spin in published articles. Butron and colleagues assessed spin in a sample of randomized controlled trials with statistically non-significant results for the primary outcome. They found that one very frequent strategy of SPIN was to actually focus on statistically significant results, but for subgroup analysis or secondary outcome. Linguistic SPIN was also frequently used. For example, they claimed that um, the association approached but did not achieve statistical significance, claiming or emphasizing the beneficial effect of the treatment despite it not being statistically significant. The level was spin, uh, of spin they found was quite high. It was 60% in the abstract conclusion and 50% in main text conclusions. So we were interested in this topic and we wanted to evaluate spin, but specifically in clinical studies, evaluating the performance of biomarkers in ovarian cancer. The reason we chose uh, the specific topic is, um, as this commentary in the PMC by Dia Mendes points out, this is an area with many promising publications, um, yet very few biomarkers have successfully been implemented or reached clinical translation in the last 30 years. Part of the reason is attributed to the technical challenges, but additional reasons are attributed to actually problems with bad methodology and poor reporting, which is very similar to other areas of biomedical research. So we searched all studies evaluating the performance of biomarkers in ovarian cancer that were published and indexed in PubMed in 2015. We included all markers of ovarian cancer risk, screening, prognosis, or treatment response in either body fluid, tissue, or imaging measurements. In the first phase, we identified 1,000 citations approximately in PubMed, and after title and abstract screening, uh, we had about half of the citations that we then screened for full text. Finally, uh, after full text screening, about 30% of the articles met all inclusion criteria, and the first 200 studies were ranked according to publication date, and we included that in our analysis. In order to evaluate SPIN, we developed a scoring system we first listed the potential categories of SPIN and then designed and piloted the data extraction form. And it was validated by a second reviewer. Um, we classified SPIN into two categories, actual forms of SPIN and facilitators of SPIN. Only 
32% of the articles had no spin. 31% had one form of spin, and 37% had two or more forms of spin. Here, we can see the different categories of spin that we identified in the studies, which I will talk about uh, with examples. The most frequent strategy of spin that we found was uh, for biomarkers that claimed other purposes that were not investigated, and that was about 32%. The exaggerated claim was made either in the main text conclusion or in the abstract conclusion, or in some cases both. So the following article exemplifies three different categories of spin. This is a diagnostic study, and the authors evaluated a biomarker panel for early ovarian cancer detection. In the discussion, they conclude on the potential of this platform as a screening method, which is neither the study aim nor is it investigated. In addition to this, the authors also claim that the biomarker panel allows for faster results and lower costs. This claim was also not investigated. Another mismatch was between the biomarker's intended clinical application and the population recruited. This study aimed to evaluate early ovarian cancer detection. But in a sample size of 31 patients that they recruited, nine patients were of late stage ovarian cancer and seven patients were healthy control, exemplifying the extreme controls that they lose used that did not match the study design. We also, um, I think I went, skipped ahead. Yes, no, I didn't. We also identified mismatch in the title and abstract conclusion compared to the results presented in the main text. The reason we looked at the title and the abstract is because the title and the abstract are the most widely read uh, part of the article. We also looked at mismatch between the conclusion in the discussion and the results in the main text, and between the results reported in the abstract versus the results reported in the main text. So we see examples of this mismatch in this article. This study looked at a score to identify ovarian cancer patients who don't benefit from primary surgery. Although the title suggests that they were evaluating the score, the results and conclusion focus on two pre proteins, neither of which are in the O-score algorithm. The two proteins were, I'm gonna mention them, KLK5 and 7, and the reason I mention them is when you look in the abstract, um, they use other KLKs for the algorithm, but not the ones that they actually report on in the results. They also claim that the uh, OF score is a strong and statistically significant predictor of surgical success, but there is no statistical test in the results. They only report an AUC value. We also identified mismatch between the intended aim and the study conclusion. For example, in this prognostic study, they investigated which microRNAs are differentially expressed in chemosensitive over in cancer tissues. In the conclusion, um, they summarized that the microRNA 1307 that they found may play a role in the development of chemoresistance in ovarian cancer. However, the cross-sectional design of the study doesn't permit conclusions about immunological mechanism affecting tumor progression. Here are some examples of spin facilitators that we identified. Almost all the studies did not present any sample size calculations. They did not discuss any harms or pre-specify a hypothesis. 56% did not pre-specify a threshold for the continuous biomarker. Such practices often lead to post hoc analysis after initial inspection of the data, and it gives room for manipulation of the results to make it look more favorable. So in conclusion, we have seen that SPIN is also prevalent in clinical studies evaluating biomarkers in ovarian cancer. The categories of SPIN were diverse, and it's possible that it's one of the explanations for the failure of biomarkers to reach clinical translation. And we should look at potential strategies and interventions to help authors avoid SPIN. So what can we do to remedy SPIN? 
Well, one thing that was also mentioned um, with the presenters is before the study starts to write the protocol and have them registered. We could also use a template for writing the abstract since the abstract and abstract conclusions are the most read parts of the publication. We can follow reporting guidelines. These checklists can have extensions with recommendations and how results should be interpreted and how to avoid spin, including limitations of the study. And I think they can help attenuate spin. Peer reviewers also have an essential role in detecting and deleting spin from published reports. So we can identify spin at peer review stage and invite the reviewers or editors perhaps to write the title and the abstract to avoid bias and generous interpretation of study results. Another thing we can do is training researchers and junior trainees um, to teach them about SPIN and its consequences. I remember when I first learned about SPIN, um, I didn't know that it was something you're not supposed to do. I thought it's something you do to get published. <laughs> and lastly, to do more research in, on research. I'm fortunate to be part of one of the PhD trainees uh, working on methods on research and on reporting in the field of clinical research. And I hope that my PhD as part of the MIR project will lead to evidence-based strategies to avoid or attenuate exaggerated claims in reports of biomarker studies and our other clinical studies. Thank you for your attention. Questions, please. I'm Adrienne Fu Berman. I direct Farmed Out, a research and education project on inappropriate pharmaceutical company promotion at Georgetown. And um, we've done a lot of work on promotional tone in industry-funded articles. We're currently working on a computational linguistics project looking at um, whether we can tell industry-funded from non-industry-funded articles. So my question to you is whether you looked at industry funding and SPIN in your study? Uh, we did look at industry funding or funding in general, but there was non-government or um, industry. Um, I, I haven't presented the results as I haven't analyzed them yet, but a lot of the times actually the funding is not reported. So that introduces. Thank you. Uh, Robert Jansko from Chicago. I wonder if you think the high-profile lay literature like the New York Times and so forth should have some responsibility in uh, uh, reducing spin. So because this is where it enters the real realm. I think there is, an, um, there is a study that looked at how spin in publications affects spin in media. And um, the results were that when the publication has spin, it's more likely that the media report on the publication will also be spun. But I don't know if in that context um, where the responsibility lies, but I certainly think that as researchers, we have a responsibility to report the results as we find them and not in necessarily a better light. Deborah Zarin from clinicaltrials.gov. Just a, just a public service announcement. Um, one place to find results without any spin is clinicaltrials.gov, where we, we aim to have just the facts and don't allow people to have any subjective narrative places, so there's no discussion or conclusions. And it might be it's something that journals could link to, so they could say sort of here's a place with just the facts and here's the author's discussion. I think it's in general very hard to separate spin from other subjective things that are going to naturally go into a discussion and conclusion section. Thank you. And on that note, my colleague Maria Olson is looking at how many of the studies have the protocol registered. So it would be also interesting to look at, um, we're working collaboration, the studies that have a high frequency of spin, how many of them actually have a protocol registered? And I was talking about, so that, that's important. But I was referring to the summary results, the actual results that might oh. also be in clinical trials. Okay. Oh, thanks. Hi, um, Laurel Oldock from Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm a graduate student. Um, I wanted to ask about one of the 
uh, results, sorry, one of the studies that you described, um, I read it kind of quickly, but it looked like it was sort of a tools development paper, and um, they, they sort of suggested a future use of the tool that they had developed. And I wonder how you differentiate between inappropriate spin and kind of appropriate future direction suggestions in a context like that. Uh, so is this the study you're referring to? That's the one, with the platform. Yeah. With the platform, yes. Um, well, I think the discussion has room to um, propose other study designs that can investigate the role <coughs> of the biomarker they find based on their preliminary results for uh, other um, aims. But what I identified as SPIN is claiming that it is useful for a screening panel when the methodology and uh, the results did not match that. And they concluded on that in the results. Thank so, you. Yeah. Okay, there are three questions left, so short questions, please. Uh, Rick Anderson from uh, the University of Utah and also the uh, Scholarly Kitchen blog. Um, my question, and, and forgive me if this was answered in your presentation and I just missed it, but one of the things that you suggested is that peer review can help to, uh, can help to eliminate spin. Yes. Did you notice a different level of incidence of spin among peer-reviewed journals in your study? Well, actually, all the journals we looked at were peer-reviewed. Okay. And I have to say that among some of the articles that I looked at, there were sentences that would um, were addressed to the reviewer that were not actually deleted. So um, peer review did not certainly catch all of the even mistakes that were there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Are Priyam from Norway. Uh, thanks for a most interesting study. Uh, there was one point I was missing from your conclusions, and that was that I think your study shows amply uh, the uh, importance of a rigorous editorial process and competent uh, journal editors who could reduce spin. So that's why we all are here, I think. Yes. Uh, and also, I think uh, authors may be biased, and um, their enthusiasm to get published may um, influence them to interpret the results more generously than they really should. So I think in that... And that's why you need a competent editor. Yes. Steve? Uh, Steve Goodman from Stanford. Um, so this is a great study. I think we've seen that these kinds of studies in, with diagnostic tests and predictive tests in general, you could pick any area and get the same results. Uh, I just, I'm wondering about the use of the word spin, though, to encompass a very broad range of issues that are, you know, could be under things like falsification or misstatement of results. And you have inconsistencies, you have overgeneralization, you have a whole range of things that are actually frank errors. And then you have issues of what might be interpretation. And I think it's very important that we don't call, and I don't think you did. Um, issues that are interpretive and say that all of that is spin, where there are these other issues that are really, really misrepresentations of what they studied and, and sometimes the results themselves. Um, so I, I, I think this is a generic problem that I don't think we can, we can go directly from results to conclusions or recommendations. It, does, it, it is an intellectual effort and we should be careful to separate that process, which I think is the heart of science, from what you're describing, which could have a whole bunch of other labels associated with it other than spin, which is, which is real misrepresentation of, of what they found. Uh, that is correct. So uh, spin is generally misrepresentation and uh, over-interpretation of the study results. Um, there were certainly a lot of mistakes in the articles that we looked at, but we didn't um, categorize that as spin. But there is um, the issue or the limitation that spin can be subjective. And there are no um, systematic criteria yet developed that to evaluate spin. And partially it's because it's um, based on study design. So I think there's more research needed in the field to shine more light on it. Last question. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
The last presentation about the same subject from Quinn Grundy from Sydney. It's been in published biomedical literature, a systematic review. Thank you. So we've just had an excellent discussion about spin and I think have identified a number of sources of spin including originally perhaps propaganda and public relations, the media has been highlighted and broadly we can group these practices as a biased presentation intended at base to present matters more favorably. In the context of scientific research we're seeing spin manifest not only as distorted interpretation of results or misleading conclusions, but also concerns over science hype, where findings are overstated. And I think the, the concerns arising from SPIN, particularly in research, are not only misinformed science and health policy, but misdirection of research agendas, exaggerated public expectations, and the potential for loss of public support in science and expertise should these promises fail to materialize. So we conducted a systematic review with the aim of understanding the nature and prevalence of spin in biomedical literature across disciplines, study designs, and clinical areas. So some of the questions we had included, you know, how has spin been studied in biomedical literature? How does it manifest? What is its prevalence? And what factors may be associated with the presence of spin? We included the examination of spin in studies of any design, not just trials. And we included all outcomes where spin, however defined and broadly defined, was quantitatively assessed. As has just been mentioned in the, the Q&A, spin is variably defined and encompasses a large variety of practices. So we were very inclusive in our search strategy and employed a number of concepts, uh, including the notion of discordance between your results and conclusions, misleading conclusions, interpretation bias, and noting that it's particularly been studied among trials with non-significant primary outcomes. So this inclusive search returned nearly 4,500 articles, and 35 met our inclusion criteria for a qualitative narrative synthesis. A number of studies had also hypothesized that industry funding might be associated with the presence of spin, and of those with a homogenous outcome measure, we were able to include seven in a quantitative meta-analysis. About 90% of the included studies were reviews of the literature in various clinical areas and looking at spin in different study designs. But two thirds of our included studies specifically investigated spin in clinical trials. About 86% of the included reviews defined spin a priori and then sought to assess the frequency, severity, characteristics according to these pre-specified uh, definitions. So using structured, standardized data extraction forms to tally the instances of spin. In contrast, a minority of reviews, largely coming from uh, Isabel Boutron and her colleagues, examined spin inductively, and they access, assessed in a more exploratory manner a range of ways that spin could manifest within a sample of studies, and this was often used to develop these instruments. Across our included reviews, however, we, we found SPIN to again be variably defined, and we inductively classified these definitions into four main categories. So firstly, a commonly known, again, as the Boutron definition, are the reporting practices which distort the interpretation of results or create misleading conclusions suggesting a more favorable result. And then there are the group of studies that specifically define spin as discordance between results and their conclusions. However, for studies particularly that are observational in design, spin could also manifest as the attribution of causality uh, where this was inappropriate. Or finally, and much more broadly, the overinterpretation or inappropriate extrapolation of results. 
A key challenge that investigators noted is that the assessment of spin is itself an exercise in interpretation and is highly contextual, and that this poses methodological challenges. So this graph shows the proportion of articles with spin in the main text across various study designs. Each circle represents a review in our systematic review, and the size of the circle corresponds to the number of articles included in each review. So you can see that on the your far left, that among trials, we saw the greatest variability in the proportion of articles containing spin, ranging from 19 to, in one review, 100% of their articles. Though the small sample sizes prevented us from statistically comparing these groups, it did appear that trials with non-significant primary outcomes or with a higher risk of bias, such as being non-randomized, appeared to have a higher prevalence of spin. So that's that second group. Few res uh, of the reviews assessed the prevalence of spin in other t study types, for example, diagnostic test accuracy studies or observational studies, but it would appear that spin remains prevalent. And two, two of the reviews assessed spin specifically in systematic reviews and meta-analyses, which demonstrated a much lower prevalence. We extracted all data on the practices used, consciously or not, to spin results among studies across different designs. And we thematically classified these into four main groups. So firstly, inappropriate interpretation given the study design. So this could be, for example, a superiority trial with a non-significant outcome, concluding that the two treatments were equally good or the use of causal language in the conclusions of an observational study. A second group of practices again refer to the inappropriate extrapolation or making recommendations for clinical practices, such as in the context of an observational study, expressing confidence in a test without suggesting the need for further confirmatory studies. A third group of practices uh, refers really to the selective reporting within a publication. So again, for example, omitting non-significant results from the abstract, but presenting them within the main text. And finally, a fourth group of practices is the presentation of conclusions more favorably than is warranted. Again, this goes back to the rhetoric one study analyzed internal documents from a pharmaceutical company and found emails asking, how to make it sound better than it looks on the graphs. Among the included reviews, a large number hypothesized that various factors related to authors, journals, and study characteristics might be associated with spin. But none of the included reviews consistently found any of these factors to be significantly associated in the same direction with spin apart from studies with non-significant primary outcomes. Due to the heterogeneity in factors measured, only seven could be included in a meta-analysis of the association between funding source and presence of spin. And we found that industry-sponsored studies were no more likely to have spin than non-industry-sponsored sp studies. And after conducting a couple of sensitivity analysis to group studies where disclosures were missing, we found the same result uh, in both categories. So spin appears to be prevalent, particularly in clinical trials, and it manifests in diverse ways. This thematic analysis could underpin the development of instruments used to assess spin across study designs and clinical areas, which could be useful for researchers in assessing their own work, but also for peer reviewers and editors. We suggest that we need to widen the investigation into the factors associated with spin. At the moment, they're highly individualized or article specific. Instead, we suggest looking at the cultures and structures around research. It's likely that certain practices may incentivize certain types of reporting. And at the moment, very little is known about these contextual factors that contribute to spin or what might be done about it. Even less is understood about the impact of spin on research, 
clinical practice or the policy environment, and we'd welcome further work in this area. Just would like to acknowledge my co-authors, Kelly Chu and Lisa Barrell. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? <coughs> yes, please. No? Uh, I have ah. a question from Twitter. Graham Steele <laughs> asks, would open peer review help reduce spin? I think it could. Um, I think there's also the possibility, as Lisa mentioned in her talk, that peer review might introduce spin. Um, we were surprised that there was even a number of reviews in a review about spin that contained spin. <laughs> so not to name any names, but you know, statements looking at some of these associated factors, again, that things were trending toward significance. These are very basic reporting conventions that just seem ir irresistible, that perhaps you know, resorting again to a very basic checklist could uh, help to mitigate. Um, I don't know that it's, it's solely the responsible of the peer reviewers or even individual researchers. Again, I think we would point to some of these incentive structures as the place to look more into how spin occurs and then how to solve it. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, Patrick Romano from UC Davis and the journal Health Services Research. Um, so I, I'm gonna be a little provocative perhaps and and say, I think that, that your review has nicely demonstrated that this concept of spin is a bit of a squishy concept. Um, and it's defined in different ways by different people. And um, what looks like spin to one person may not to another person. I think it may be because I come from a journal that publishes in health policy. Um, and so from my perspective, spin is somewhat inevitable. I mean, it comes out of the political science arena where we know that if we watch Fox News, we get one spin. We watch MSNBC, we get a different spin. Every party puts its own spin. Um, so is it possible to distinguish the, the forms of spin, if you will, that are um, inevitable, that are appropriate um, for authors, obviously, to um, interpret their own findings as they see, see fit and to suggest um, ways in which the literature may evolve? from the forms of spin that are more malignant, if you will, um, as, as previous questioners have suggested, that really represent clear misinterpretations of the findings. So, so I think that would, be, that would be important. To some extent, we may also need to do more to educate um, the readers um, mm -hmm. and stakeholders that some degree of spin is healthy. It's part of the process of intellectual discussion and debate, um, and that we have to have our, um, our ears up for it, we have to recognize it, we have to push back, but it's all pro part of a, a, a robust process of discussion and debate sometimes. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think, first of all, there, there's a gap in the empirical literature here, <laughs> again, on the impact of spin. So we don't empirically have a good sense of what types of spin are actually affecting readers and decisions. So that's a key piece that's missing. Um, again, Bouchon and colleagues, they did a, an investigation, I believe it was in the context of systematic reviews, where they did an expert survey to rank the severity of different types of spin. And so I think we can begin to differentiate between those that are, are truly a, on the side of falsification versus those that are interpretation. And I myself am a qualitative researcher, so I certainly am not in a position for advocating against interpretation. And I think we live in an area where expertise actually has a role to play in interpreting empirical findings, but that, that needs to happen very rigorously and transparently, and no more trending towards significance. But just to come back to this question, what is the role of interrate variability? When you give a paper to read to five researchers and you ask them to rate the spin degree on a scale of one to 100 or whatever, I'm sure that, that they will not reach the same result. 
Absolutely, and, and I think that's again what our review shows is that spin is, is not a unified concept and that it does differ across study design. It's highly contextual, so I think a measure of you know, spin on a scale of zero to 100 is not appropriate, and so a checklist would have to be nuanced. It would have to be taking spin in context. Okay, there are four questions left, starting. David Schreiger, UCLA. Following on the last question, so much of this Congress is about this notion that if we only eliminate bias and spin from the literature, we'll have a better literature. But I just question whether that's really the right model. If you think of a court of law, everyone's aware that the plaintiff and defense act, you know, lawyers are putting as much spin as possible on the case, and, and the, there's an interested party that's interested in sorting all that out and trying to find the truth. Is the problem with our literature not so much the way that we create articles or report articles, but the fact that there really isn't a community in medical science that's actively vetting the stuff, in that most articles are, you know, the, their greatest value is to the person who wrote it, in, in that they get a notch on their CV. And in fact, you know, you look at PubMed Commons, it's basically barren. There's almost no discussion of any of the articles to see, is this article of merit or not? So I just wonder, is the issue really an issue of there's spin creeping into the articles or the fact that no one cares to sort it out? Yeah, and I, mean, I think that's again why we want to place emphasis on these contextual and structural problems that have been ignored. Um, Lisa in her, in her talk this morning highlighted the number of things that, that authors are now being asked for. I think the last few papers I've written, you have to provide a tweet. You have to summarize your findings in 140 characters. These things are not reviewed. They're not vetted. Your universities are happy for you to attract whatever media attention you can, whether that's positive, negative, spun. Um, and yet, I think more than ever, it's important that experts are having these conversations and providing interpretation. And I would argue that we, we need a science of interpretation. Qualitative research, social sciences may have a lot to offer to that conversation. Verti Salahim from the Finnish Medical Journals, Journal, we are all humans and like our own ideas and like them to be uh, found evidence on them. Uh, you said that you didn't find any, any uh, connection with the uh, correlation with the uh, industry sponsor. And in abstract book, you explain this negative finding uh, by the uh, possible heterogeneity of these seven included articles. Is this also a kind of a spin? Mm, absolutely. And I think we, we certainly have the tendency to, uh, I was commenting this the other day, that if it's a positive finding, it must be true. And if it's a negative finding, it's probably a small sample size or heterogeneity. Um, I think in this case, it's also quite possible, I was thinking about this, that industry-sponsored research has less reason to spin so going back to those contextual findings, if they're, you know, we've talked about publication bias, if they're already publishing high-profile trials with high-profile authors, perhaps, uh, you know, they're getting into these higher impact factor journals, they're already attracting the media attention. Uh, I don't know, maybe there's other explanations. Uh, Kay Dickerson, Johns Hopkins. Um, Maybe it's what people have already said, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I think all of us really have to look at ourselves, too, because I always say to ourselves and our, my co-authors, well, we've been taught to tell a story in our publications, and is telling a story spin? And so I'd really like to see us examine ourselves in the future to see whether we are spinning by telling a good story. Yeah, and I think the comment though earlier, um, this idea that there are, there are certain spin practices that are actually omitting things or falsifying, and I do think that is categorically different than telling a story with your findings, which, which I would believe is actually essential. But trying to separate some of these out um, I think that's work that needs to be done. Adrian Cooperman, farmed out Georgetown. Industry-funded studies are almost always spun, and my question to you is whether you examined the abstracts separately. So in the, our included reviews, there was a variety. So there were some who looked at abstracts alone, some that looked exclusively at the main text, and some that looked at both. 
So um, the prevalence chart that I showed you, we have a similar one for abstracts, and I, I think as um, the previous presenter uh, showed that spin in abstracts tends to be higher and more severe. But in that meta-analysis, I can just go back. I believe that this is specifically for the main text. I think also the caveats here is that, that these were across different study designs. So some of these are observational, some were meta-analyses, some are trials. And of course, the definition of spin is a little bit nebulous. So not to explain away negative results. <laughs> Um, I would ad advise you to do an analysis of the industry funding with the abstracts only. I can okay. tell you one of the things that's, I think, you, um, one of the things about my project is that we have industry insiders who work with us. Industry only cares about the abstract because that's the only part that clinicians read, yeah. despite what they say. Yeah, yes. yeah. I'd be interested to hear more about your work. Any others? Yes. I try to <clears throat> read this from Facebook. Researchers aren't practicing medicine like full-time clinicians. Is research used by third-party payers? I'm sorry. <laughs> Do I start? Mm. Try it out. <laughs> Researchers aren't practicing medicine like full-time clinicians. Is research used by third-party payers to establish dogma for clinicians the real spin? Perhaps. <laughs> There's a question for future research. <laughs> so again, understanding severity, understanding the impact, I think, is a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? So then there is lunchtime on the second floor, and the program will continue at 1.30. Drummond will be here. <laughs>